السلام علیکم و رحمت الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و صلی الله علی محمد و آله الطاهرین First I would like to offer my condolences on the martyrdom anniversary of our 10th Imam, Imam Hadi alayhi salam. And also I want to thank the committee at IEC and the organizers who had invited me and for all those who made these few days very comfortable, especially Sayyid Oftab Haider and his respectable family for hosting me these last few days. Continuing from yesterday's talk on ma'rifat nafs on gnosis with a G, gnosis of the self. And inshallah we'll try and finish it off tonight. So in verse number 105, in chapter 5, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu alaykum an fusakum. So observe, pay heed to yourselves. La yadurrukum man dhalla idhahtadaytum. One who goes astray can't harm you. If you're guided though, ila la marajukum jamia. Your return is with Allah. We started with this verse. This verse, the destination in Allah is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the destination. The way, there's a way, because it's speaking about losing or finding, being guided or being misguided. So there's a way here. And what was the way? Last night we said the way is the soul. You are the way. And then in chapter 59, verse 19, if you remember, the equation there was, if you forget Allah, if you, لا تكونوا كالذين نسوا الله, don't be like those who forget Allah. Why? فأنصاهم. It'll make you forget yourselves. If you forget Allah, if you forget the destination, you'll forget the soul, yourself, the way. Like if you want to go to Detroit, if you forget your destination, you've lost the way. The, the way has no meaning. If you forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll forget your soul. And then we said, however, if you know the soul, if you get to know yourself, man arafa nafsa, faqad arafa rabba, you'll get to know Allah. But there was a problem with that. And then we sorted the problem out, and then we interpreted it as whoever gets to know one's self, they got to know Allah before. You have to know Allah first before you know yourself. Then we described, if you remember, the thread, the shop analogy. I don't want to go through all that again. But that you have to understand Tawheed, pure Tawheed. That Allah is the first, the last, the outer, the inner. Of all things, nothing is Allah less, nothing is existence less. If that is understood, that Tawheed is understood, then you'll get to know yourself. How? Because when, when everything is Him in dimension, you, which, who are part of the world, you are nothing. And that's important to acknowledge in self-recognition, that you are nothing. And from there, we want to grow. That's where we left it off last night. So the more Tawheed one 
experiences or acknowledges, the more one will see oneself as nothing. It's a gradual process. I'll explain this bit by bit. And the more tohid one has and sees oneself as nothing, the more one will be disassociated from other than Allah. The more huwa al wal akhir wal dahir wal batin is the first, last, outer, inner of all things. In proportion to the amount of this tawheed you acknowledge, in proportion to that, you will disassociate from other than Allah. Now, up to now, until last night, two things, or one matter has become acknowledged, that I, me, and everything outside me, creation, it's all dependent. Nothing is independent. When Allah is the first, the last, the outer and inner, everything is dependent by nature. If we forget this point, if we... Uh, everything is dependent. It's like in the clothes shop, the shirt and the trousers, the glove, the hat is dependent on the thread. In this world, everything, including I, the me, is dependent. The more we forget this point, that everything is dependent, the more we forget it. The verse said, don't be like those who forget Allah. Allah was who? Al-Awwalu wal-Akhiru wal dahiru wal batin That meant everything is wholly dependent existence-wise. Nothing has existence independently. It's all him in dimension. Okay. If we forget that everything, including me, we are dependent, see this statement I'm repeating many times because it's an offshoot of forgetting Allah. Those who have understood this, they're understanding the discussion up to now. An offshoot of forgetting Allah, who is huwal awwal, huwal akhir, huwal dahir, huwal batin, is forgetting that everything is dependent. Once you start forgetting that everything is dependent, and we forget this, that everything is dependent because of not recalling Allah, that Tawheed, once this happens, the side effect is you assign effects to the worldly causes. You assign independence to the worldly causes. What does that mean? You go to the doctor. Look, the doctor cures you. You see the doctor as the curer. Why? You forgot. Because of forgetting Allah. Because of forgetting Tawheed. Because of forgetting, I think this was a very important part, the microphone stop. Because of forgetting Hual Awalu Wal Akhiru Wal Dahiru Wal Batin, because of that, you started assigning independence to worldly causes. You go to the doctor, he cures you, you see the doctor as the cause. Because of forgetting Hual Awalu Wal Akhir. Of course, you have to thank the doctor, but Shafi, Allah is the curer. You forgot that. Because you forgot Allah, you forgot Tawheed. La takunu kalladhina nasullah. Because then you'll forget yourself. You'll 
start attributing to yourself or attributing to uh, things around you rather than seeing everything as wholly dependent, nothing. You go to the grocery, you buy some fruit, you see the grocery as providing you, giving sustenance. But when you forget that everything is dependent, essentially and existentially, you keep on assigning worldly things as causes. That's a side effect of a lack of tawheed. Or you put the alarm on the car to protect it. But Hawal Hafid, Hawal Hafiz, Allah is the protector. But you see the alarm. You see, you're forgetting Allah. You've, you've, you've assigned independence to the alarm system because of that attachment or because of that forgetting. This verse, you have to, this has to be your dhikr during the day, wherever you go. Or even you're, you're being taught something. I'm, I'm teaching you something and you see me as teaching you. You assign independence to me. You think I am teaching you. But it's Allah. You're forgetting Allah. Or you even attribute your actions to yourself. You say, my house, my car. I, I study, I studied, I have a PhD, I have that. All these actions you're attributing to yourself, where all of them are manifestations of Allah's attributes. You forgot that, and you forgot yourself. Which, what self? That you're nothing. How? Because you're attributing everything to yourself. All the actions, all your achievements. But you forgot yourself. The more you attribute to yourself, the more you attribute to outside yourself, it's a symptom of you forgetting Tawheed. Real Tawheed. Real Tawheed. And just imagine how drowned we are. It's embarrassing. I'm even embarrassed even saying these things. Enter the discussion of shirk. Here now shirk has meaning now. Because anything which compromises this form of tohi that we've discussed up to now is shirk. Shirk has levels. However much you attribute independence to causes other than Allah, it's shirk. Like the doctor, the grocery, the alarm system, the teacher. You're a mushrik. It's not haram, but it's a form of concealed shirk. You're contaminating yourself. That which is haram is the open form of shirk. See, X person, for example, is Allah. Sealed shirk, no, you're contaminating yourself. You're contaminating the soul when you attribute independence to causes other than Allah. When you attribute actions to yourself, it's a form of shirk. You're ascribing actions to other than Allah. When you say, my this, my that, it's a form of shirk. You're ascribing things to other than Allah, to yourself. All these must be eliminated, all these false attributions, but step by step. Illnesses such as Riyā, you know, that kind of ostentation where you, you do things in front of people, so people see or hear you, you're not doing it for Allah's sake, 
Sometimes it's ibadat, even with all actions, it includes all actions, not only ibadat. With ibadat it becomes haram, with other actions it becomes contaminating your soul. Although Ayatollah Jawadi always says it, with non-ibadat, riya is also haram. That makes things very difficult sometimes. It's not a common position, but it's certainly frightening. driving but yes moment to moment actually it becomes difficult but when or ojb self-conceit riya and ojb when do they arise it only arises when you are drowned in those attributings to the worldly causes or to yourself when you say my car, you believe it's your car, and therefore you want to show it off. You say my salat, I did salat or lain. You think it's yours, you show it off. But if you acknowledge you are nothing, by means of tawheed, by means of wal awwal wal akhir, what do you have? If you see yourself as nothing, what do you have? to show off, look, then there'll be no real, there'll be no self-conceit, because you see yourself as nothing, you have nothing to pose, to boast, to be self-conceited, but until those false attributes are still within you, the threat of Riya will always be there. The threat of self-conceit will always be there. With one's ibadat, with one's studying, with one's marrying, with one's children, with all, one by one. With one's reading the Qur'an, reading the du'as. The threat is always there. But if you succeed through Tawheed to know yourself, what is yourself? Nothingness. You acknowledge it though. Through Tawheed, you have nothing to pose. You have nothing to boast about. So if the minus my, my car, my house, my PhD, my job, this my-ness, if this goes, then yes, the threat of Rio and many spiritual illnesses go automatically one now begins to grow because they're not contaminating themselves moment to moment during the day imam hadi alayhi salam in one tradition he states al hasad Mahiqul Hasanat. Jealousy, it destroys, gets rid of all your good deeds. Why? With this introduction now we understand this. Because you believe something is yours, you believe something is theirs, then you, you become jealous. And that's contaminating you. Even all your good deeds that you're doing with a jealous heart, which is a sickness of lack of tawheed, lack of wal awwal wal akhir. Yes, oh yes, you're full of my this, my that, he has that, he has that. Yes, you become jealous. You've lost yourself. <coughs> One who's jealous, they've lost themselves. If jealousy is within, you haven't expressed it, you're contaminating yourself. All your good deeds, it's, it's a minimum. If you express your jealousy outside yourself to others, then it becomes even haram from a Sharia perspective. So this Tawheed has to be incorporated. The question is how? 
that's with education, but how? We want something practical to practice every day for this tohi to be incorporated in us. Now listen carefully here. Which toheed, that toheed, which allows us to acknowledge everything is dependent. That toheed, which enables us to never assign independence to other than Allah, these worldly causes. That toheed, which enables us never to make these false attributes to the I. I did this, I did that, my car, my house. And it's something very simple. Here, Allah Metabotawai, it's a very important step, this. Something we can all practice. He says, look at your knowledge. For example, when I want to teach people, I'm speaking about myself. Sometimes when I speak with people teaching them, it has an effect people, it affects them. Sometimes when I teach them, it doesn't have an effect. Or sometimes when I advise myself, it affects me. Sometimes though, even my own words has no effect upon me. Sometimes I cry when, for example, the musibat of Amir al-Mu'minin is mentioned, I cry. Sometimes I don't cry. Look, the same musibat, I don't cry. Sometimes I am joyous because of something. Sometimes I'm not joyous, happy because of something. What's happening here? There's something very important in these steps that we've taken for granted. What is it? It doesn't matter if you become joyous or you don't. It doesn't matter if you become sorrowful or you don't. It doesn't matter if you have an effect sometimes or you don't. That which is important is that you identify the cause of these differences. Because when you speak, it has an effect sometimes. And sometimes it doesn't have an effect. Irrespective of that, you have to say to yourself, I am not the cause. If I was the cause, it should have an effect every time. If I was the cause of being sorrowful, whenever I wanted, I could cry. Why, do, why don't I cry sometimes? I cry sometimes, I sometimes don't. It means I'm not the cause. I'm not the cause of being joyous. If that was the case, whenever I wanted, I could be joyous. But sometimes I'm not. I'm not the cause of giving, granting an effect. If that was the case, whenever I would will, I would lead, enable that effect to be actualized. When you see these changes, this makes you identify that the cause of these effects is not you. And it's not anyone. And that makes you recall Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That cause of these states, that's important to identify. Not the fact that you have an effect or you don't. You become happy or you don't. In the Quran, there's a clause which is, It's Allah that makes people laugh or makes people cry. Look, he is the one. With all the change of states that we undergo, we, this helps us to acknowledge 
I am nothing. It's not me. None of it is me. If it was me, I could have done it any time I willed. It's not me in play. It's all Allah's attributes. Now, this is something, it's a practical prescription. Araftullah bi fasrin azaim. I got to have gnosis. Araftu. Amir al Mu'minin said. I got to have gnosis of Allah through the changing of my decisions. I wanted to do something, something else. Something, I wanted to do this, something else happened. All this change, it wasn't me. I got to know Allah through that. That's the practical prescription. That's the key. The more this is inculcated within you, the stronger that tawheed will be. The result I am nothing then. That outside me is nothing. And that's important. With each success in this regard, in every walk of life, with every change of state, whenever you succeed in acknowledging this, A satanic hurdle is eliminated and humility will increase gradually the more you succeed with this prescription because more and more you're seeing yourself as not the cause with that practical prescription the result will be because Shaitan wants you to see yourself and other things as independent causes. That's the whole battle with Shaitan. The more, with that practical prescription, you remove this thinking, you deconstruct those mental constructs. With every success, you've eliminated one hurdle, satanic hurdle. And you've re replaced it with an angelic humility. And the result is, with time, you should become more and more humble. If you're not becoming more and more humble, problems are arising. You're not succeeding with this prescription. So the more I am nothing arises, the more I am nothingness is acknowledged here, the more ikhlas you can practice. Where in ikhlas you say, I commit X action for Allah's sake. I dedicate X action for the sake of Allah. That's what ikhlas means, being a mukhlis. Look, there's still an I. You say I, dedicate. That's one problem. Then you say, I dedicate X action. You're attributing to the I. You see the I, one problem. You attribute to the I, two problems. And you say for Allah's sake, well, when you see the eye and you attribute to the eye, that's not the real Allah yet. It's still a rational Allah, you've understood. It's not the real existing But the lesser you attribute things to yourself, the lesser you attribute actions to yourself, through that prescription, the lesser you see yourself, because the lesser you attribute to yourself, the more I am nothing is being acquired. The lesser you see yourself, then yes, you're succeeding. 
but it's all in relation to how much your Tawheed is incorporated. But once you succeed in Tawheed, through that practical prescription, and you more and more you see yourself as nothing, more and more you don't attribute actions to yourself, you're becoming more and more now sincere, more and more mukhlis, the degree of ikhlas is increasing as the eye and attributings to the eye is decreasing. Ikhlas is increasing. You're still a mukhlis though, but the degree of mukhlis, your mukhlisness is increasing. You're not a mukhlas yet. To be mukhlas, the eye has to be slaughtered. We'll come to that in a minute. But you're a mukhlis. Mukhlis has degrees. The more the eye is eliminated, the more the attributings to the eye are eliminated, and that's through Tawheed, the more mukhlis you are. But as long as there is an eye, there is an attributing to the eye, you're not mukhlas. Okay, can we evaluate ourselves? Our degree of mukhlis. Can we evaluate ourselves? Is there any system of evaluating what degree of ikhlas we're in right now? Yes. Do you want to evaluate yourself to see how much really you've decreased the attributings to the eye through tawheed? How much you've decreased it? Is there a way to judge ourselves when we do that practical prescription? Yes, there is. Let's say I write a book and then someone took it from me and published it in their name. Will I be disappointed? If the answer is yes, it's because you, you saw, you first you didn't dedicate it to Allah and you, you saw yourself as the writer. If you had dedicated it to Allah and you had seen Him as the writer. Someone has stolen it, published it in their name. Why should you be disappointed? Look, what Allah knows, you were supposedly doing it for Him, you dedicated it for Him. Why, why disappointed? It means no, you weren't dedicating it for Him. Why? Because your Tawheed was weak. You didn't see Him as the source. You saw yourself. You believe you lost something. You lost something. You believe that thing was yours. You were the possessor. Look. You didn't, that Tawheed was compromised. Look how things can change. You invite someone to your house. They never invite you back. You get disappointed. Yeah, look. Why? you truly scrutinize yourself, you can see the level of ikhlas. And if you're honest to yourself, it should be very, it should affect you. That's why lying is bad. That's why lying is the key to all sins. Because if you lie to yourself, you can never spiritually waver it. You have to be honest to yourself. Sometimes you use Allah as a means to something, not as an end. That's also shirk. That's also ascribing other than Allah to Allah. You look, this is even the ibadat, good actions. You do salat to go to heaven. You're using Allah as a means, as a ticket to something, heaven. Is it haram? Of course not. It's not haram, but it is shirk. Not shirk in the haram sense, concealed shirk. The Quran says it. Most of those who believe in Allah, they are mushrik. But they believe in Allah. So it can't be mushrik in the open sense that X is Allah. Otherwise, they, Allah wouldn't say they're believers. 
it's a machinic and a concealed fashion. When you attribute to yourself, you see worldly causes as the cause. Or you use Allah as a means to something. That's shirk, you're contaminating yourself. It's not haram though, according to the Sharia, but it's certainly haram according to the tariq. You fast so you don't go to hell. Look, it's good to start to have these motives and incentives. But come on, after 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, until when are you going to be stuck with these incentives? When are you going to fast? When are you going to pray? Hubban lillah, out of love for Allah. Where Allah is the end, not a means for you to go to heaven. You give sadaqah, so your burdens be relieved. Look, Allah is used as a means again. For what ends? Your burdens to go. You still you're seeing yourself. You're still seeing yourself. When Tawheed is compromised, Allah will always be a means for you. It's only when Huwal Awwal Huwal Akhir becomes perfected that Allah will always be an end. It's like when one spouse says to the other spouse, I like you. Sometimes one spouse says, I like you because they want the other spouse to get them a gift or cook them food or do something. They're using the spouse as a means. A means to what? Cuisine. But they say, I like you. And they do. But as a means to something. Sometimes someone says, I like you, irrespective of what you do. I like you for who you are. Is the first kind of liking better or the second? The second. The entity is used as an ends, not a means. Our actions shouldn't be done to go to heaven. That's one form of shirk. Shouldn't be done to escape hell. That's another form of shirk. It should be done hubban lillah. And you can evaluate yourself if you're doing things out of satisfaction of Allah, out of love of Allah, for the sake of Allah with those examples I gave, and you can think of others. It has to be hubban lillah. The more tawheed you acknowledge, the more love you will have to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more you acknowledge this huwal awwal huwal akhir. That leads to you not seeing yourself with those false attributes, getting ground in yourself. The more you will love Allah. Now, I'll speak about that in a minute. And the more you love Allah, the more you recall Him, that Tawheed. The more you have that Tawheed, then you it keeps on continuing. That recalling more and more, when your love of Allah becomes more and more. When you do all actions out of his love. In chapter 4, verse 48, In Allah, Allah, ay Allah doesn't forgive when he is ascribed with shirk. When other than Allah is ascribed to Allah, Allah won't forgive it. Allah doesn't forgive shirk. Shirk is used in the absolute sense here. It means he won't forgive open forms of shirk and he won't forgive concealed forms. When you are a mushrik, you're contaminating the soul. That contamination will always be with you. Always. Unless you repent. But it's never going to go away. Even the concealed forms of shirk. He'll forgive that which is lesser than that, though. 
the ulama have said that means when you do concealed shirk inadvertently sahwan or nisyanan forgetfully that Allah will forgive because it was done inadvertently out of neglect forgetting but then the verse ends وَمَا يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ whoever executes shirk shirk used in the absolute sense فَقَدْ فَقَدْ افْتَرَى إِثْمًا عَظِيمًا they've made up a tremendous wrongdoing sin they've concocted an extremely large sin for themselves with shirk Sayyid Ali Qadi he uses this in his testament, in his will. He says, I'm scared to explain what this means to my children. What this verse means. For a long time, when I first read the will, which a journal of the Jose published, this part of the will, it was a question for me. Why would Sayyid Ali Qadi say that? And um, when we studied Erfan, I got the answer there. Maybe, maybe this is the answer. In another verse, I'll give the answer in a minute. In another verse, chapter 928, The Mushrik is Najis. Look, Mushrik here. Is najis. It's used in the absolute sense again. Be it the open form of shirk or concealed shirk. There was one scholar, he's passed away now, very good scholar. He said here, Mushrikun, it's not the open form of shirk. Because he believes that even the you know mushriks, they're not najis. And they say, well, what about this verse? He said, yeah, he, he was a very respectable manager, but I don't want to give the name or anything. But there's a point I want to mention here. It's a minority position. We shouldn't really be attracted to this. Most of the four are 99%. Mushrik is Najis. There may be one or two. He was one of them. <coughs> so they said, well, this is the verse. It says, Mushrikun, they're Najis. He said, no, this is that spiritual mushrik, but in that form of concealed shirk, they're not najis. Look, first of all, the verse is used in the absolute sense. It can cover both. But we believe in a unity of body and soul. There's a unity. It's not two realities. Why do we say the mushrik is najis? Because their aqaid, their mushrik, is fasid. They say X is Allah. Their fasid, the soul, with that knowledge that they believe in, the soul is contaminated. The body is a manifestation of the soul. That's why we have psychosomatic reactions and illnesses. It's, a, it's one reality. It has an effect on one another. This physical body is a subtle manifestation of the immaterial soul. It's one reality. When we say it for women to cover their hijab, it, they're covering their soul because the body is a manifestation of the soul. And therefore they become increased in chastity because they're covering the soul. Flesh to flesh with non-mahram is haram. Because when you touch non-mahram, you're touching the soul. Two souls are in contact. You're contaminating yourself. You wear gloves though, why, why, isn't, it, why isn't that a problem? Because the, the gloves is not a manifestation of your soul. For men, the hijab, they have to cover a certain area of their face. They have to cover it, otherwise their chastity will be compromised. There's a unity here. If the soul is a recipient of falsed knowledge, of contaminated knowledge, the body is going to be contaminated. 
It's not Jesus. Look. But that which Ali Ghazi wants to say is the next step. If you understood what I've said, you can get to the next step. I don't want to say it. I said it once in one place. Everyone became pessimistic. I felt very guilty. I never repeated it again. Those who are aware know what the next step is. But, so these levels of shirk, they have to go. How? How do they have to go? With all those actions? You do hubban lillah, out of love of Allah, for the sake of Allah, not using Allah as a ticket, as a means. And you only do that because you attribute to the eye, you attribute worldly causes, independence. But with hubban lillah, there, more and more you're recalling Allah through that tawheed. In chapter 3, verse 31, قول, the messenger say to everyone, in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, if you want to love Allah, if you want to love Allah, fattabi'uni yuhbibkum Allah. If you want to love Allah, you follow me, the Prophet. Then Allah will love you. If Allah loves you, when you reach to that level, then when your ikhlas is increasing bit by bit, as we explained, you can never kill the eye. You can't do it because you have a love for the eye. But when the ikhlas is getting stronger and stronger by means of you decreasing those attributes through tawheed, eliminating the ego through tawheed, seeing yourself as nothing through tawheed, the degrees of ikhlas gets higher and higher until Allah can kill you, the ego. And then you, that nothingness is there. You become mukhlas. Look, there's a hadith of Qudsi, man arafani ahabbani. One who knows me through that tawheed, they will like me. Wa man ahabbani ashaqani. One who likes me, over time they'll love me to get stronger and stronger. وَمَنْ أَشَقَنِي قَتَلْ um, قَتَلْتُهُ Allah says Whoever loves me when it reaches that level I'll kill them They kill, kill the eye They're now nothing But Allah has to kill it You can't do it You just have to increase your ikhlas more and more with practice through that prescription more and more until the click happens Jadabe happens. The pull from Allah, that divine pull, realized, becomes realized. Qataltu, I'll kill them. Wa man qataltuhu fa'alayya diyatuhu. Whoever I, Allah, kill, their blood money is upon me. Wa man alayya diyatuhu. And upon whoever my blood money is upon, upon whoever I have to give the blood money, I am the blood money. Why? Because when you are nothing, now you're a reflection and manifestation of Allah's attributes. Before, those false attributes were hindering it. But when you're nothing, Allah will reveal his attributes, reflect them upon you. Look. Amirul Mu'minin alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Aliyun ma'al haq. Wal haqqo ma'al ali. Look. We were speaking about through tawheed you get to know yourself. Remember, مَا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ 
And we explain that. It's all him in dimension. But what does aliyun ma'am haq mean? Look. Aliyun ma'am haq. Before we said everything is a manifestation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's nothing Allah less. You understand who al awwal, who al akhir, who al dhahir, who al batin. You'll know yourself. You'll know yourself that you're nothing. Aliyun ma'al haq. He's with haq. He's a reflection of all of Allah's attributes, manifestation of all of Allah's attributes. And that's why we have other traditions that say, Man arafa nafsa faqad arafa waliya. One who knows oneself, they knew their wali from before. Look, aliyun ma al haq. And that we have to pay attention to. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.